Israelites from Egypt towards the promised land. We go through an exodus when we depart from somewhere into somewhere. We depart from captivity into freedom. We depart from hate into love, from despair into hope, from depression into joy, from complacency into compassion, from guilt into forgiveness, from irrelevance into purpose, and from the mundane life that we too often live in into the abundant life that Jesus talks about. Are you ready for your exodus? Good morning, everybody. And good morning to all you in the house, and good morning to those who are watching online right now. We are glad that you're part of us around the country and around the world. I want to give a special shout out today to the students of Pfeiffer University. I know you're gathering together now, and uh, a lot of you are watching the, watching the, the messages, watching the, the services. So God bless you, and I hope you just have an amazing, amazing day. And happy Labor Day weekend to everybody here. You know, one of, um, one of the, the, the coolest feelings on earth to me and my whole life through has been the day, the moment when you get out of school for a summer. You know what I'm saying? You remember that feeling when you just get out and all of a sudden, the, you know, you see your, the, the last class, the last test, the last final, the last whatever, and you walk out and it is, it is freedom for several weeks or several months. I think that's one of the greatest feelings on this earth. And I, and I can't imagine what the teachers feel like when they get the educational uh, freedom as, uh, as well. But I thought, if that's such a great feeling, freedom is always a great feeling, isn't it? When you get free from something, especially something that's been, you know, that's tormenting you, free from something that is harassing you, free from something that has, has held you captive, it is such a great feeling to be set free. And we're talking about that in a, in a series that we're doing right now uh, on, on freedom. And we've been taking a look at the book of, uh, of Exodus. This. And, and we continue that to, uh, today. Don't miss next week because we're going to be talking about just celebrating uh, 25 years together as a church. And uh, we're going to be doing that in the morning, but then also at night we're going to really have a celebration uh, starting at 5.30, I think, for, for food and everything, for those who want to come there, and, and 6.30 and come as, as, as you want because there's going to be people, you feel free to be out front. There's going to be people just in their cars, wherever you feel safe, that's where we want you to, uh, to be. But it's going to be a big, big celebration with a, a super fun ending as, as well. But you know, the, the children of Israel, when they were, uh, when they were being, being set free, God went out of his way to do a couple of weird things. One of them was this. God had them go the long way. God could have had them go a shorter way, a much shorter way, but he intentionally made them go a longer way. Go ahead and show that up there. Watch this. All right, here's the way they could have gone. God could have had them right here and go, zoom, you know, do not pass go, do not collect $200. But instead, he had them go this whole convoluted way. Imagine this. I mean, this is the way they ended up going. And here's the question. Why in the world would a God who loved them make them go the long way around? God tells us in his, in his word. He says this. God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though, the, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. I love this. God knew what they could handle and what they couldn't handle. And God isn't going to make them go into a situation that they couldn't handle. He knew, God knows everything, and God knew what they couldn't handle, and he knew that if they went into uh, just straight away, th uh, the fastest way, they'd be going through Philistine territory, and the Philistines would come after them in an army, and they would face a battle that they weren't ready for. So God only put them through what they could handle and what they were ready for. And I thank God for that. I thank God that we serve a God that, first of all, knows what we can handle and what we can't handle, and he will only allow us to go through what we can handle with his grace. Now, there's that caveat of with his grace, because I don't know about you, you know, you hear the saying a lot of times, God will never give us more than we can handle, right? Is that in the Bible? No. And is it true? No. Because God, in our, in, in our own strength, God will let us go through a lot of things that we can't handle in our own strength. He'll have us face adversity that we can't handle in our own strength. He will have, I mean, there will be things that we will come our way and provision that we can't handle in our own provision, in our own resources and things. But here's the thing, God will always 
give us what we can handle through his grace, through his strength, through his provision, through his whatever. And it's kind of like this. There's a, you know, uh, I love looking at the documentaries on the, you know, on, on deep sea diving and things like that, on, on the submarines that go down way deep and everything. And the thing that blows me away is this is that, that well, where there's these places where these incredible submarines can't go because it's too deep, because it's too, the, the uh, everything, you know, the, the, there is something called a crush depth. And if the submarine goes too deep, that the, it will crush, the, the submarine will crush. And even though those things are a, an inch or two thick, it can be crushed. But at the same time, while these, well, these submarines can get crushed at that depth, there's these little fish that go around and swim with no problem. And how is that possible? How in the world is that possible? It's because of this. God makes it where those fish have a, have a pressure on the inside, a strength on the inside that is greater than the pressure on the outside. And the same thing was true with, true with God's Holy Spirit. God will never give us more on the outside than he hasn't given us grace for on the inside. I want to say that again. No matter what you go through, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter what pressure you're facing right now, no matter what adversity you're facing right now, God will never allow you to go through more pressure on the outside than he hasn't given you grace for on the, uh, on the inside. And something else, he'll, he'll never have us face more temptation, not just more adversity, but he'll never have us face more temptation that we can handle through his grace. Listen to this incredible promise from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. He says this, but remember that the temptations that come into your life, they are no different from what anybody else experiences. And God is faithful. Hear that word again. Some need to hear that. God is faithful. He will keep the temptations from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. When you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you don't have to give in to it. I love that. What an incredible promise. First, he's never going to give us anything that we can't handle, any temptation that we can't handle in his strength and in his, uh, in his grace. And he'll always have a, a back door. No matter what temptation we'll, always, we'll ever face, there will be a way out of it. We'll never have to say, I had to go to that temptation because God gives us the grace and God gives us a way out. And maybe you right now, maybe you feel like God's taking you the long way. Maybe, maybe God is taking you the long way right now. Whatever is you're going through in life, it just seems like it's going the long way to, uh, to get there. And, and maybe it's because of this. Maybe because God knows what you can and can't handle. And, he, and he, if he puts you through the direct way, it would be to your detriment instead of your benefit. And something else is he wants to prepare you for when that time comes, to when you go to that promised land, that you're going to be ready for it, that you're going to be prepared for it. My middle daughter, Cassie, right now is in her fourth year of, uh, of medical school. And it wasn't until the third year that they had them go through the boards, the medical boards. Why didn't they just do that at the very beginning? Why didn't they just give them the medical boards at the very start? Uh, we know why, right? Because if they were given those boards, they would be completely blown away. They wouldn't be ready for it. They would, they would fail miserably, and they would be absolutely discouraged. So the professors, in their knowledge, don't give them something that they're not ready for, and then they prepare them for that, uh, for that, that voyage, that, that journey. And the same thing with how many football fans do we have? Raise your hand. God bless you. I see those hands. I love those hands. I love football. And I can't wait for football season. But, but why, do, why do they not go just immediately as, as they, they step back on the, on the field immediately? Why do they usually go through, through uh, the, you know, uh, the, the games beforehand, preseason? Why do they usually go through, why do they go through, through training camp? It's because they're not ready to play yet. Their body's not ready to play yet. They're not ready to, to play as a team. So the coach, in their wisdom, have them prepared and play all these other games and all these scrimmages and everything to prepare them for that. Now, if coaches, if we trust coaches, and if we trust those, the, the other things in life, the professors and things like that, that they know what's best and will prepare us for what, to get us ready for that, can we not trust God? that he's going to get us ready for what we need to be ready for, and he will not let us uh, have us face things that we are not prepared for. Another thing is, too, is, is this, that God not only had them go the long way, God also had them go backwards before he had them go forwards. 
Don't miss that. I mean, God told them, told Moses, he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to start out this way, but then I want you to go back towards the Red Sea. Why would God have them go back a little bit towards Egypt for a little, for a little while? God had a plan. And, and if you hear nothing else today, I want you to hear that. God has a a plan. God has a plan for you. God has a better plan than you have a plan. No matter what plan you have for your own life, God has a better plan. And here's what he knew. God knew that as long as Pharaoh was out and around, God knew as long as the Egyptian army was there, God's people were never going to be, they're never going to be in peace. They're always going to be harassed. They're always going to be that, that struggle to, go, to be pulled back to, uh, to captivity. They will never be safe. It would be like a, a, a man-eating tiger that's around a village. As long as that tiger's there, there's no safety for the village. As long as it's there, nobody's going to be at peace. Nobody's going to be safe and as long as Pharaoh and his army is, is around and kicking God's people are never going to be safe or at, uh, or at peace so God baited Satan and Satan Pharaoh okay God baited baited Pharaoh and here's what he had him to uh, to do he said all right here's what's going to happen as you go back towards uh, towards uh, the Red Sea Pharaoh's going to think that, that you're just uh, all confused and just wandering around in the, the, the desert. So he's going to take his army back to try to bring you back to captivity. And that's exactly what took, uh, what took place. Now, I said a few weeks ago, I talked about an, uh, an arrow being, being sent out. An arrow will always go back, you know, before it is sent forward, right? It's always back. Now, if you were that arrow, you're going, okay, why in the world am I going backwards? I want to go this way. Why would I possibly be going backwards? But the one, the archer knows the best thing to do and the necessary thing to do is to pull back before it is shot forward. And some of you right now, may, you may feel like you're just, you're being brought backwards, and especially during the season of COVID and everything, maybe it feels like, man, my life has gone backwards, not forwards. But understand that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, God promises that he's going to work all things together for good. And even if you go backwards for a while, it's only going to be because God's going to launch you forward eventually. And I think there's another reason why God had this happen is because, because this is going to be an incredible thing. In the next few weeks, we're going to hear about the, what happened at the Red Sea. And it's amazing. It's one of the greatest stories in the Bible. It's one of the greatest stories there is. And, and just of God's faithfulness, of God's power, of God's strength, of God being just amazing. And we'd miss all that if they did not go back there. And here's something else. When the king of Egypt, let's go back to Exodus chapter 14. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We've let the Israelites go and have lost their services. In other words, men, our entire workforce has left the building. So he had his chariots made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the, of the best chariots, Listen to that again. He took 600 of his best chariots, along with all the other chariots in Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites, who were marching out boldly. I love that picture. The Egyptians, uh, the Egyptians all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea. And I saw that part about 600 of his best of his best chariots. I mean, why, why point that out? Why say 600 of his best chariots? And I thought of this. I thought, don't miss that. The enemy uses his heavy, heaviest artillery on the people who are carrying the greatest purpose. And if a lot is coming against you, it means that God has put a lot in you. And that's what uh, Satan is, uh, is afraid of. And then he took the rest of the chariots. So can you imagine? you got several thousand chariots come against you. Put yourself in their sandals for a moment. And you're walking out. You're going out, walking out boldly away from Egypt. And, and you're there with your family. And suddenly you hear this sound. And you look behind you. And there is the mightiest army bearing down on you. The, the, the chariots were the tanks of their day. And you've got a couple thousand chariots coming at you. A couple thousand tanks heading towards you. That's what's behind you. You look in front of you and you've got a sea. You do not have a pond. You do not have a lake. You have a sea in front of you. You talk about being a, a, between a rock and a hard place when you are stuck between the mightiest army in the world and a sea that you can't get over. That's between a rock and a hard place. That is truly being majorly stuck. And here's something, don't ever forget this. This is something that just uh, will, will affect our life when we understand this. Where God guides 
Pharaoh always follows. I want to talk about the Pharaohs of life. When you walk out into your destiny, when you walk out into your inheritance, when you walk out and begin to walk out in your freedom, I want you to know something. There will always be a Pharaoh that will try to keep you back and bring you back into captivity, away from your inheritance, away from your freedom. There will always be Pharaohs there. And so, uh, so what we have here is, is he's not going to let you go easy. He's never going to let you go easy. If you're walking in your freedom, he's never going to go, oh, well, see ya. All right, it was great knowing you, bye. No, he's going to go after you maybe even harder than ever before. There's a young man that uh, called me a couple of months ago, and we were talking on the, on the phone. He said, man, it's just like, it, he's, it's just like it, I'm getting attack after attack after attack after attack after attack, and the temptations are just incredible right now in my life. And, it just, and I said, hey, you know what? I just want to tell you something. I want to encourage you with something. The reason Satan is coming after you so much is because he knows what you carry. He is afraid of you. He knows you are going to stomp his head. He knows that you are going to be raised up and you're going to make a difference in this world. And he doesn't want you to do that. He's going to do everything he can to keep you from that, from, from that happening. So when that happens, if you have a lot going against you right now, wear it as a badge of honor because that means you also have a lot going for you. If heaven, hell's going against you, that means heaven is, 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 has a, is a powerful place in your, uh, in your life. And here's what you do. If Satan isn't coming against you right now, that's when you should be worried. You know why? Because what that means is you're no threat to him. You know, you know maybe he already has you. Maybe you're already, you're not walking in your freedom, so he's already got you, so you don't even have to, he's not even have to worry about you. But man, if he's coming against you, wear it as a badge of, uh, of honor. And there's two people really in the Bible that as they're walking in their freedom, as they're doing things, that, uh, that you just watch Satan coming against them in a strong way, the pharaohs of the world. One of them, and I, I could use a lot of illustrations. I'll use one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. One is, uh, is Nehemiah. And you know, Nehemiah was raised up from God to go back to Jerusalem to help rebuild the walls because the walls of Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Babylonian army and when you have a city in those days that did not have a wall they were sitting ducks for anybody to come in and, uh, and destroy them. So the walls were really, really important. And, and Nehemiah goes back there to help rebuild the walls. And there's these two guys named Sanballat and Tobiah that every time you look at them in the book of Nehemiah, they are always coming against Nehemiah. They're always coming against God's people. They're going after him time and time again. They're going to, to harass them. They're trying to belittle them. They're trying to intimidate them. They are threatening them. And they're trying to discourage them all of those times. And know that as you walk in, as you try to build something for God, as you try to build a life for God, as you try to build a family for God, as you try to build a, 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 a ministry for God, as you try to build a whatever it is for God, there's always going to be a, a Tobiah and there's going to be a sand ballot to try to mess things up and discourage you and intimidate you and threaten you and mock you and everything else. And then we look at the, the greatest example, Jesus Christ. As he is doing his ministry, there's always the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees that no matter what he's doing, they're against it. I mean, he's, he's healing people and they're whipping out their calendar going, nope, wrong date, can't heal on this date, right? They're trying to, to trap him in his words. They're trying to, as he, is, as he sets somebody free from demonic possession, they're going, oh, the reason he can do that is because he's in cahoots with the devil. That's why he can do that. He does a miracle, and instead of rejoicing like all the people around them are rejoicing, what are they doing? They're trying to figure out a way to kill him. And as you do your ministry, whatever that is, in your family, in your job, in your school, wherever God launches you out in there, understand there's always going to be a, a, some Pharisees and Sadducees that try to knock you, that try to knock you down as, uh, as, as well. And I thought of this too, that not all opposition you will face will come from evil sources. Remember with, with, when Jesus said to the disciples three times, he said, hey, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be killed there. And here's what, um, here's what he said uh, that, uh, that Peter, who meant well, Peter, one of the most faithful disciples, his buddy, his, one of his closest friends, this is what Peter said. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to, said to Peter, get behind me, Woo, what is this? Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. 
Peter was being used of Satan to try to keep Jesus from the, from the cross, even though he was meaning well. And sometimes that can happen. Even meaning well people can sometimes try to put a damper on where you're going with God and what you're wanting to do. I remember when I first came to, to faith in Christ, there were several old friends that tried to get me back to where I was, the way I was living before. And this is kind of weird too, is, is every time when my dad was alive, Every time my dad was, uh, that I was about to go on a mission trip that I remember, my dad tried to talk me out of it. And it's not because my dad didn't love God. And it's not because my dad didn't believe in missions. And it's not because my dad, any of those things. It was because he was afraid for my life. And I, we would go to a lot of places that were very dangerous. And he'd go, Dad, you don't need to go there. Come on, send, somebody else will go there. You don't have to go there. And, and he would try to talk me out of it and, and to go, Dad, I'm being called there. I'm being called, but instead of sometimes him being the biggest encouragement, sometimes he was the one that tried to take that. And now understand, he always supported me. He always prayed for me, always financially supported me, went on a mission trip, but because I was his son, he would try to keep me away from going to the places that God was calling me to, to, to do. And something else is, I remember that, that when I first came to Christ, uh, there were two, my two pastors set me down and they said, you're taking this Jesus thing way too seriously. My pastors did that. Two of the very people that should have been say, encouraging me the most, supporting me the most and, and helping me out in the ministry the most were the people that were putting a wet blanket on that. And I remember the day, man, like it was yesterday, and I, I, I remember just being so discouraged when your pastors t- put you down and say, man, you need, to, you need to calm down on this Jesus thing. Uh, I remember going to the, to the base of the mountains in Colorado in my car and drove there, and man, I burst into tears. And I mean, I am broken. And I'm saying, God, I remember crying out and what I said to God. I said, God, I will go wherever you send, tell me to go. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I just ask one thing in my life, that you use this life and you use my life to make a difference in this world. But the very two people, sometimes the people that love you the most and care about you sometimes can be the people that are, are a blanket there. And I, you know, I, I've seen this so many times when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Uh, that, that well-meaning Christian folks sometimes that, that it's, I don't know what it is about the Father, Son, that that's cool, but if you get on fire with the Holy Spirit, that sometimes that people put a damper on that. Or you start going in the, in the gifts of the Spirit, and people say, oh, these gifts are for today, these aren't gifts for today, but man, 1 Corinthians, you look at that, and you see God says that, uh, that we're supposed to know the gifts, and we're supposed to want the gifts, and we're supposed to work out and, and, and use, use our gifts that he's, that he's given us. And, and, you know, and, and so, so a lot of times, if somebody tries to put a wet blanket on you in that, don't let them. Another thing is, here's some great news that I have, is there's always going to be the Pharaohs, there's always going to be Sanballats and Tobias, there's always going to be the, the Pharisees and things, but uh, there will always be people who will try to, uh, to, to have, there will always be powers of hell and schemes of man that will try to keep you from being the, the man of God or the woman of God that God's, God's called you to be. There will always be that. We're going to sing a song in just a few moments that, that one of my favorite parts of this song are where it says, it's, a, it's in Christ alone, it says, no power of hell and no scheme of man will ever pluck him from, uh, from you from his hand. And, and understand that, that, there's, that God's with you and he's never going to let you go even in the midst of that. When all the pharaohs are going loose, there's still going to be angelic armies and there's going to be things that are supporting you. And, here's, and God says this, he says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. He says, there's no weapon formed against you that's gonna prosper. And he says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And he also says that, that uh, he's gonna stand by you through thick and thin and that, uh, I forgot the verse I was about to say. Here's this other, in Exodus chapter, um, uh, chapter 14, he says this, as Pharaoh approached the Israelites, looked up, and there, uh, there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified. Put yourself in those places. And cried out to the Lord. And look at what the Israelites did when they were terrified. They said to Moses, Was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us out into the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Isn't that incredible? Here they attack Moses. They attack the very one that set them free, and now because the kitchen gets hot, they're attacking, they're attacking him. And, uh, and you know, I just want to say this to the parents in here. There may come day where the people that you bore, 
the little people that you took care of and you loved and you've let, taken care of and, and given them what they needed and fed them and clothed them and changed their diapers and everything, there may come a time where they come back, maybe in their teenage years, and they attack you and they go after you, especially when everything's going wrong in their life, that they may go after you. But understand, just keep your head up because there's going to come a time where they come back and they're thankful for what you've, uh, for what you've done. And listen to this. Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? By the way, no, they didn't say that. In fact, they were saying, help us, help us, help us. Please get us out of Egypt. Get us out of Egypt. Get us out of Egypt. And then they say something really stupid. It would have been better for us to have served the Egyptians than to die in the desert. A few weeks ago, we talked about the back to Egypt committees. There's always the ones that no matter when the kitchen gets hot with them, they're always saying, let's go back to Egypt. 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 And here's the thing that I want us to, to know is when we get stuck like they're stuck, we get stupid. Is that true? I mean, don't we? we get, when we get stuck, so many times we say things we shouldn't say. We do things we shouldn't do. When we get stuck, we get stupid. I'm not saying we are stupid. I'm saying we do stupid things. We date people we should never date. We buy things we should never buy. We eat things we should never eat. We have midlife crises, right, that get us just deeper and deeper and deeper stuck. We reach out to things and grab hold of things that just get us, again, more stuck and more stuck and more stuck. I was talking to a, to a counselor a, a while back, and, and he was talking about, we were talking about just the, the power of pornography on, on, on men in our, in our country. And he was saying, you know, the weird thing that I found is, is pornography really has little to do with sex. It has way more to do with control. And a lot of guys, when they just seem other things are going out of control in their life, they reach towards something, and they'll reach towards this one thing that a lot of times will just get them more in bondage and more in bondage. And when they get stuck, they get stupid. And men aren't the only ones that do that. We sometimes do it in different ways, and sometimes we do it in the same ways. But a lot of times, when we get stuck, we get stupid. And a lot of, uh, something that I, there was a, a person that I knew, a friend in another state. And what happened was this, that, that he felt stuck in his marriage because they had not had relations for eight years, and he felt stuck. So the way he decided to get unstuck was to put, to put himself in the arms of another woman. And what do you think happened there? He's got more stuck and more stuck and more stuck. His family fell apart. His marriage fell, up, uh, fell apart. And so then to get unstuck from that, he got even more stupid and turned to a bottle. And again, got more stuck and more stuck and has been in and out of, of rehab centers for the last couple of, a couple of years. And here's the thing that, we, that he understood that we need to all understand is when we turn to anything else to get us unstuck besides our Lord, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we're gonna just get more stuck and it's gonna be like this. It's gonna be like this, this, this tractor here. That how many times have we been like this in, in life? Sometimes we start getting stuck and things not, aren't working out the way we hope and are and they don't. And so we do, what we do is we just put the pedal to the metal and we just get more stuck and more stuck and more stuck. But here's the good news. We serve a God who loves to get us unstuck, who is an expert at getting us unstuck. In fact, when he was, the very first things that he ever said in public ministry was he quoted the book of Isaiah and he said this, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know what that's saying? He said, I've come to set people free. I've come to get people unstuck so you can we get off of stupid let me ask you this question do you feel like right now in your life that maybe God is taking you the long way in an area maybe instead of being frustrated maybe we ask the question God what are you trying to teach me in this time maybe thank you God that I don't even see it I don't even see why you're taking me the long way but I know you want the best for me and I know there's something that I would be facing right now that if I went the short way that would be to my detriment and maybe that, uh, maybe you feel like you've been uh, going backwards instead of forwards right now. And maybe the reason you're going backwards is because God is just taking you back so he can prepare you to launch you into something new and amazing in your, uh, in your life. Another thing, maybe you're feeling that, her, that all, the Pharaoh in life is harassing you. And, and understand, where does a badge of honor because that was really saying that God, God, Pharaoh sends his, his best stuff out for those who are making the biggest difference. 
And also, have you been stuck on stupid? Is there an area away in your life right now that you're stuck and you've been reaching out for the wrong thing, you've been looking to the wrong thing to set you free in that? And God's saying, just look to me because I have everything you need in order to set you free. And if we could bow our head and close our eyes. Thank you, God, that you're amazing. Thank you, God, that you are so good to us. Thank you, God, that you know what we can handle and what we can't handle. Thank you, God, that you are an expert at setting us free. And God, for every time we get stuck on stupid, God, forgive us. And right now, we just ask that you send us the tow truck of heaven and get us out of this because we can't get out ourselves. And Lord God, thank you that you... um, you care for us en- enough also just to, to even sometimes have us go backwards before we can go forwards. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your care. And we give our lives to you afresh and anew again, Lord Jesus, because you care for us so much. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.